evening everyone please be seated welcome to another peaceful solution character education teacher certification class here uh, we are going to um, uh, continue in the uh, self-control unit I'd like to welcome everybody and thank you for for joining us those who us are who are able to be here as well as those who are uh, joining us online who are watching at a at a distance we know that <clears throat> you know all of these uh, these classes uh, are are posted online and of course you can go back and and look at them uh, of course if you're watching now obviously you know where to find them uh, but but we always remind and encourage everyone to go back and and rewatch the previous classes uh, even before these classes that we're having uh, live to go back and rewatch the previous classes it'll bring you up to date we're up to speed with what we're going to be covering tonight. Plus, it's just great to rehearse this. If you remember what William brought out in the last class about uh, our minds and our, our ability to retain information. And, um, uh, you know, 5% after, uh, after a day or so or a few hours of, of hearing something is not a lot, right? So when we're dealing with something that we're talking about here that relates to our character and our ability to make decisions that uh, affect the outcome of not only our lives, but the life of others and the environment around us. It's, you can see the importance of consistency, consistently going back and rehearsing this information over and over and over again until it becomes, you know, like it said, second nature. You know, when you can recall something or do something uh, without having to go back and necessarily look at a book, uh, that's when it becomes a part of you right uh, that's when it becomes integrally integrally um, a part of your your thought process your behavior and how you govern your emotions how you make your choices and so forth and that might seem like it's an impossibility when you take a look <coughs> at all of these books from character all the way through responsibility and you see hundred or so or two hundred pages and you multiply that by five or so you're looking at over you know a thousand or eleven hundred pages of information that might seem overwhelming at the time but remember you know these things are broken down in small easy to consume pieces right and when we get the point the main point of the particular lesson that's being presented and associate that with our daily lives right how can we put these things into practice in our daily lives and this is why the uh, when you go through these books there's the examples that are given uh, there's activities that are given because it ties the lesson into everyday life people can remember things a little bit better when they can associate with them and so that's why as a teacher it, it's kind of important to to know your audience it's important to be able to uh, relay the information that's presented in the peaceful solution according to how it's presented but also in a way, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you can feed people, but when you feed people from certain areas, there's a, a cultural difference, right? There's a, some people like spicy food, some people like uh, maybe bland food, you know, some people might like boiled duck. I don't know. I've never had that. Doesn't really sound tasty, but maybe it, you know, it might, it might be something that someone likes. People might like things with a lot of uh, uh, um, curry in it and, and, and so forth. So... <clears throat> In that way, you know, as a teacher, it's kind of up to you to add that little bit of spice to your class is what I'm trying to say, right? And to be able to appeal to your audience. And that could seem a little bit difficult at times because within a class, you're going to have different varieties of people, different cultures, different personalities and so forth. But the main goal is to help them to understand the points or the concepts that are presented in the Peaceful Solution uh, in a way that they could apply it in their life. You know, it has to be simple. So, you know, that's why, you know, you when we read these these lessons, you'll notice that in the material itself, you know, you won't see uh, extremely large words, you know, difficult to understand words. Uh, and, and a lot of those words that you might see are also presented in the, in the glossary part in the back of the book to help the, the student better understand them. But as a teacher, and you'll see that continuously, what we've been doing for the last uh, several classes here, well, since we've really started this, uh, the continual defining of certain words. Because when you understand the definition of the word, you'll understand the application. And it's important to understand how to apply 
these these concepts in our lives. Otherwise, you know, we'll go off thinking, you know, uh, positively about something that is negative. You know, I was mentioning to someone the other day about how a person can think that they had, uh, you know, thinking positive, they can think that they successfully robbed a bank, right? Now, in their mind, they're thinking, you know, I'm just being optimistic, you know? <laughs> that bank robbery was a success, right? And they could be, ha and, and to look at the, uh, <clears throat> look at this concept of being positive or optimistic and use it in a negative way. So it's important to know these things and to be able to differentiate between what's positive, what's negative, if it brings harm to ourselves, others, and the environment, uh, then, of course, that's something that we don't want to do in any way, right? Harm does not only mean, and as we covered in the previous classes, um, it's not always something physical, right? Uh, when you steal from somebody, you bring harm to that person. <clears throat> you think about people and, uh, you know, they work, they, drink, they bring in an income, and that income enables them to provide for their families, right? Whether it's rent, whether it's <clears throat> utilities, or, or whether it's food, right? Food's very important. And food's becoming, uh, I don't want to say it's becoming more rare, but if you go into your grocery stores uh, anytime in the last six to, to 12 months, you'll see that uh, many of the staples that were commonly uh, and regularly supplied on the grocery store shelves are becoming more scarce, okay? And, uh, and it's, you know, when, when we're in a situation like that, having the resources to be able to provide for your family when you can is important. Well, if somebody steals from a person, takes away part of their livelihood, that brings harm to them because now they're not able to provide the necessities to support their family. So even though you didn't shoot them or you didn't punch them or something like that, uh, there is a still a form of harm that comes as a result of engaging in, in in immoral activities <clears throat> and so that's what we're talking about here uh, the choices that we make because like William covered in the previous class you know many people don't realize that they have the power to choose uh, people think that they are subject to their environment they're subject to um, just go with the flow because that's the way it's always been done Okay, and this is why education is so very important, and this is why it's reiterated over and over and over in the Peaceful Solution, because in order for you to know that you can or can't do something, or that you should or shouldn't do something, well, you have to have the information presented to you. And this is a part of what we're talking about here in regards to a choice. <clears throat> now, last time, or last class, uh, we talked about uh, some of the negative options uh, that uh, you know, people are faced with. In this class, we're going to talk about some of the positive options uh, that will come about. But before we get started, let's turn back to our lesson plan here, just to re rehearse that lesson plan. And we'll look back to <clears throat> lesson plan uh, one, uh, page F. Lesson plan one, page F. And of course, this evening, we're going to be picking up on on page 18, and, and this was gone through, but we'll reiterate it again here, uh, and look at procedure six. It says, stress to students that as they learn to control their thoughts about themselves and others, they need to understand the role choices play in practicing self-control. Now, you remember, when we were talking about controlling our thoughts about ourselves and others, you know, we had that precursor to that in the previous unit of acceptance, right? Accepting uh, yourself, accepting things about yourself that can't change, you can't change, <clears throat> and accepting things about uh, others, right? Accepting diversity and things of that nature. Um, but in, 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 you know, a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A, um, a nonchalant way, we were talking about self control, right? Self control, practicing self control. Uh, controlling their thoughts about themselves and others, they need to understand the role choices play in practicing self-control. And it says, instruct students to turn to page 16 through 19, of course, William read this last class, uh, and read the section entitled, It's a Matter of Choice, and complete the exercises. Emphasize that self-control means taking the time to weigh all the options and make the best possible morally acceptable decision. And that 
those three words there in that sentence is what we don't see a lot of taking place in society today, especially amongst a lot of youth. It's not just youth, it's adults as well. Um, but taking the time, right? There's a lot of impulsivity, a lot of impulsive decisions that are made that people later regret, okay? But you can't go back and undecide on that particular choice. Once you make that choice and then act on it, there is no undoing it, okay? Uh, now, a person can, can make a choice in their mind but not follow through with it, right? Uh, maybe because they thought it out a little bit more or possibly because they talk to uh, maybe a trusted adult or a friend or, or they found information that would not have supported that choice. And so as a result, they change their mind. And there's nothing wrong with changing your mind, especially if the decision that you were about to make would have brought harm to yourself or someone else, okay? And so it's okay to occasionally change our mind when we make a, make a decision on something, just it's once we follow through with it, once we act on it, there's no undoing it. So take the time, taking the time to weigh all the options, which in order to be able to weigh all the options, you have to have all the options presented to you. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to be right in front of you right at that time. So again, this, we reiterate to the students that this requires them to go and get the facts. Remember, that's a part of edu being educated, getting the facts. There's a lot of ways to get the facts nowadays, and it's very easy in a lot of cases to obtain facts, uh, whether it's going to a, a trusted adult, someone who is educated in that particular field. Uh, like we've mentioned, you know, if you wanted to learn something about, um, you know, um, how your computer operates, you know, you're going to talk to somebody who is maybe into computer programming, or you're going to talk to possibly, you know, uh, an electrical engineer who, who understands about circuitry and things of that nature. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily go to a painter and ask them, <laughs> you know, unless you wanted to paint your computer, but you're going to go to somebody who is trained in that field, okay? And so, this is why we have to get the correct facts from the correct people in order to be able to positively make a decision uh, to, to make, like, as it says here, the best possible, and again, morally acceptable decision. And I'm glad that that was added in there because you can leave it at make the best possible decision and the person can, can leave off with, well, that was the best decision that I could make at that time. You know, I can go around this guy who was uh, causing road rage, or I can just run him right over. Running him right over seemed to be the best thing to get me from point A to point B. No, you have to take into consideration morally acceptable as well, okay? Remember, running that person over brings harm to them, okay? Uh, so that would not be a morally acceptable decision, just as an example. So let's look back to, um, let me see here. Let's look back to page 18 um, and hold your spot there. And before we do that, let's just turn back to page 17 because this kind of uh, started this section off here of the negative and positive options. Uh, and look at the very top of page 17. It says, Choice <clears throat> choices or options can basically be placed into two categories, just like influences, right, can be placed into two categories. Uh, friends can be placed into two, two categories. A lot of things can be placed into two categories. And in what we're referring to, we see it can be placed in the category of either negative or positive. Now, here are a few points to help you distinguish between positive, a positive, and a negative choice. And of course, uh, William went over and covered some of these things in the previous class uh, in regards to bullying and sniffing glue and refusing to participate in PE class and of course stealing some <coughs> <coughs> excuse me stealing someone's wallet <clears throat> which of course these things he gave examples of and shown how they could negatively impact uh, the individual who did it and others well on page 18 we're going to talk about some of the positive options positive options so let's look over to page 18 there and it says here a positive option notice brings reward rewards and as we covered we separate rewards and options merely for uh, re rewards and consequences merely for clarif clarif 
clarification purposes. <laughs> My tongue's being twisted this day. Uh, and if you look at that word option there from dictionary.com, uh, it, it simply means the power of right, the power or right, I'm sorry, the power of right or wrong choosing. Okay, the power of right or wrong choosing. And if you remember what William covered in the previous class, uh, if you turn back to page 16 under It's a Matter of Choice, uh, we see there in that second sentence, a choice is the power to make a, a selection between one or more options. All right, a choice is the power to make a selection between one or more options. And as we've covered previously and we've gone over and over and over again, and we'll continue to go over and over and over again, uh, understanding where that power comes from, it comes from the knowledge of knowing the difference between what's right and wrong. Now, as we uh, given the example, a person can have the power and not use it, right? A person can have the power to make the right choice, but decide not to make the right choice, right? Just like a person can have an outlet sitting there where they can draw power from in order to operate a lamp, you know, a vacuum cleaner, uh, a radio or whatever, but choose not to do it. Okay, so uh, the power or the potential is there, but of course each individual has to make the decision to apply it, right? Apply what you learn. Otherwise, the words in this book, they become absolutely useless. They, they, they just become letters on a page, numbers and letters on a page. It's when we put these things into action into our own lives that we see that power exercised. So the power of right or wrong choosing. Now, the first point here in a positive option brings rewards is um, something to consider is it's moral. All right. A positive option is moral. Uh, it shows value for life, yours and others, and it respects the possessions of others and the environment. All right. It respects the possession of others and the environment. If you remember the very last things, last thing that we talked about see here in that example that was given uh, that William covered in the previous uh, uh, lesson, uh, number four. On page 17, stealing someone's wallet, right? Stealing someone's wallet. Well, when you steal someone's wallet, you know, you're not showing the respect for the possession of others, right? Because you're taking something that doesn't belong to you. And of course, everyone has rights of ownership and those rights regarding their belongings means that they should be safe from harm or theft or anything of that nature. For example, accepting the, the ethnic diversity of others. Now, we talked a lot about that in the acceptance unit understanding about diversity and the differences uh, uh, between people from different nations and, and cultures and things of that nature. Um, uh, that's a part of it. That's a part of how you can show value for life, right? And if you just think about what we covered in the um, character unit in regards to what we covered, what we're talking about here in this first point in, um, in morality or moral, a positive option is moral because it shows values for life. Now, if you remember on page four or page eight of the character unit, we talked about the three basic categories of morality and how it's broken down. Uh, behavior and attitude towards all life, right? All life, okay? Uh, whether it's human, animal, or plant, uh, behavior and attitude towards possessions and property, right? Because everything belongs to someone. And if you remember some of the examples that were shown that, that William put up on the slides, uh, the graffiti. And I think every single one of us who's lived anywhere <laughs> throughout the United States or pretty much throughout the world, you know, you've seen graffiti, you know, and it's real popular for uh, people to what they call tag. And that, that's a lot of those graffiti uh, um, drawings, you know, that they put in particular areas, you know, they tag uh, certain places, walls. Uh, buildings, uh, trains are one of them, uh, you know, they'll do this. And, and again, like it was brought up in the previous class, you know, this is showing disrespect for that owner, right? And, and the people that have to pay for those things are the taxpayers. In a lot of cases, the taxpayers have to pay to get those things removed. And companies have made millions, if not billions of dollars, um, formulating codings 
that are what they call anti-graffiti coatings. You know, they can put it on their buildings, put spray it on their bricks, their masonry, uh, their siding, whatever it is, so that when someone does come and vandalize the building, then they can easily remove it with a simple, you know, pressure washer or maybe a little bit of a light solvent and then it's gone. But that's an extra expense that a company, a person has to go through to protect their belongings from somebody who's not going to show respect for them. And again, why? Because they haven't been taught, they haven't been trained, they haven't been shown the value of respect. So they do these types of things and it, and it destroys the possession of others. It also destroys the environment, right? It, it, because it's not showing respect for them. And we talked a little bit about that in the character unit and how, how when people don't dispose of waste properly, right? They don't get rid of trash in a popular manner, in a, in a proper manner. Um, pretty much throughout the city, uh, many cities, especially big cities, uh, where people congregate, uh, cities will go through the effort of putting waste receptacles uh, in various places so you know, people eat and they're waiting for the bus or something like that. They can throw trash in the proper wet waste receptacle instead of just throwing it on the ground. You know, there's nothing like walking through a neighborhood and seeing cups blowing all over the place and, you know, diapers in the parking lot and all types of uh, horrible things that you don't want to see in the neighborhood, but because people, you know, I, 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 I've known of people who would, uh, when I, you know, used to work at an apartment community uh, back up north, uh, people would, now these were people who lived in this apartment community. They would come home, they would park their car in an open spot, and they had assigned spots, but they would park their car in an open spot, and then they would take their ashtray out of their car and dump the cigarettes on the ground. You know, and then put the ashtray, the clean ashtray now, back in their car. Okay, they didn't want that dirt in their car, but they didn't mind dumping it on the on the ground. Now this is unsightly. You know, not everyone smokes, right? Uh, plus, somebody, namely me, had to go and clean that up. And in all honesty, the dumpster was only 20 feet away. You know, if they were that lazy, they could actually drove their car next to the dumpster and got out and dumped those cigarette butts in that dumpster. But that's when people have a lack of regard, a lack of respect for their environment. And sadly, this is in their own environment, their own community where they live. OK, and that takes place quite a bit. And this is why education is so important, because per personally, you know, I like to go into an area where it looks clean. Right. It smells clean. It doesn't smell like you know, urine when you walk down certain alleyways and, and waste and trash, you know, because people don't throw trash in the trash dumpsters. They set them next to the dumpsters. I've seen that before, too, right, instead of just lifting it up a couple of feet and setting it in there. And so what occurs? They tuck the time to bag it up from their house, and they tuck it all the way out to the dumpster and set it right in front of the dumpster. Well, what do the animals do? The animals are hungry. What are the animals' jobs? Well, it's their job to clean things up. They get into a trash bag and they take everything out and they're selective. They don't want to eat pencils and things like that, so they only get what they want. And there's trash all over the place. And so, you know, somebody who's walking down the alley and putting their trash in the dumpster, they're having to walk over and, and pick up and you know, sometimes they do pick up somebody else's trash. It's just, you know, so many things. People don't stop and think how one person's actions can affect an entire group or community of people. And this is why education is so important. And we'll see here. Um, I wanted to read you something here from the, uh, this is from earthday.org. Now, this is from February 28th of, <coughs> excuse me, of 2019. <clears throat> so almost three years ago. And the, the topic here was how our trash impacts the environment. Because we make a lot of trash, you know, um, uh, I know my family, they, they seem to make a lot of trash too, uh, but, but just the way things are, are packaged and, and, and the way you buy things, there's a lot of a waste that comes from it. Um, and this article here says that, the, that weight, the waste humans generate has been detrimental to our environment for quite some time now. Humans are generating too much trash and cannot deal with it in a sustainable way. Waste that is not biodegradable and cannot be properly recycled is filling our oceans and landfills. And we'll remember what we talked about previously about the big uh, plastic ocean, that is, or yeah, the plastic island 
that is out in the middle of the ocean. It's kind of where currents converge, and it's a kind of a swirling island of, of plastic trash and how it affects uh, a lot of the sea life. They get, you know, soda can uh, dispenser holders, you know, wrapped around their necks, and, and turtles have had, you know, uh, things that they've swallowed, and, 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 you know, occasionally marine biologists and things like biologists will people of this nature will find these, you know, animals and try to help them and try to bring awareness to it. But, you know, all these things come from, from mankind. It says here, let's take plastic waste for as an example. A recent study found that of the 6.3 billion metric tons of plastic waste that is produced, only 9% of that, less than 10%, has been recycled, right? 6.3 billion metric tons. Uh, according to the EPA, they calculated that the total generation of municipal solid waste in the United States just that year, that is for 2017, was 267.8 million tons. 267.8 million tons. Now, where does all that go, right? All that trash that we throw out it's like we just throw it out in the dumpster or, you know, if you lived in the city, you know, you set, set it on the, well, we used to set trash on the curb. I think most places now have uh, trash bins that you can just roll your trash bin out to the curb. And then when you come home, it disappears, right? The trash is gone and you roll a nice empty bin back to your, your garage or the side of your house and, and we don't even worry about it anymore, right? But that trash, that waste has to be processed, okay? Now, most of the time that's being done responsibly when we, you know, take it and put it in our dumpster. And sometimes you have, uh, they'll give you a regular trash and they'll give you a recyclable ones where you can put recyclable things in there. But even still, only 9% of that is properly recycled, which means it's going and it's getting into an area where it's not degrading and creating more stress for the environment. And of course, they were just showing how that those levels were up from the previous year of 2015, which was 5.7 million um, metric tons of an, of an increase. So, and of course they go on to talk about how it affects the climate, how it affects um, marine life and animal life and so forth. And um, there's plenty of documentaries about that, but this is what occurs when we make choices that are, that are immoral, okay? Not necessarily buying those things, but you know, we, we should be responsible in how we dispose of our waste as well. Next here it says, a positive option is based on proven facts. Now we've covered this over and over when we, when we talk about facts, right? True, frac, true facts, not false facts, true facts, right? Um, uh, you know, something that has been proven to be true, not just something that someone randomly says, but it's proven. This word proven here, remember what we covered on this in previous classes, it means to test the accuracy of or demonstrate the truth or existence of a thing. All right, test the accuracy of or demonstrate the truth or existence of a thing. Okay, and so, you know, in order to test the accuracy of information, a lot of times you have to get more information. <laughs> you know, get more information because uh, sometimes people might have uh, uh, inaccurate information in regards to a particular topic. So you have to go to, to different resources to, to compare that and make sure it is accurate. And sometimes, like I said, you have to go to authoritative sources, people who know what they're talking about in that particular field. And it's funny because when you read certain of these blogs, you know, anybody can go online and make a blog about anything. You know, there's there's no restrictions. You know, you can go out there and you can say, you know, in, in your uh, bio, you know, foremost expert on on sand recycling, right? In Texas, yep. you can say anything, right? And people will go on there if they type in, you know, how do I recycle sand? I don't know that you need to recycle sand, but just give you an example, right? And that person's page will come up, and then they might have some pretty convincing information on there. But is it accurate? Is it factual? You know, I could put anything online and you know what people say, well, if it's online, it's got to be true, right? <laughs> you know, I saw that on YouTube. It must be accurate. And many people have YouTube degrees in various things, right? Because they saw it on a YouTube video. 
uh, sadly, people try to do these things and they end up getting themselves hurt. Uh, like watching all these chiropractic videos and now they try to crack their own neck and they're in the ER afterwards. So we have to be careful about the facts that we given, that we, that we obtain to make sure that they're based on proven facts, right? That they're accurate, okay? And it says here, we see, by educating yourself, and this comes back to the student, you know, even as a teacher, we're always students. By educating yourself, you can make intelligent moral choices. For example, you learn about the dangers of smoking and choose never to smoke. And it could be in many different things. Now today, you know, things, people would move more towards, uh, you know, you still have smokers. <clears throat> I think that, um, I don't know if it was a, a, an effort to reduce the amount of smoking when uh, prices went from, you know, a dollar fifty a pack to six dollars and something odd cents a pack, you know, uh, some people might have stopped smoking because they just figured they couldn't afford that that habit or they might have smoked a little bit less. But you know what? For the most part, people found a way to pay six or seven dollars a pack for smoking. Right. So that didn't change anything. But but when a person educates themselves and realize, you know, then that might be the wake up call. Well, six dollars a pack. You know, I need to think a little bit more about this. You know, is this really healthy for me? Is it beneficial for me? And they decide to educate themselves and find out, yeah, you know, I'm actually doing I'm doing harm to my body by doing this, you know, so I'm just going to eliminate it altogether. And as a result, you know, if a person was a three pack a smoker or three pack a day smoker, now they've just saved themselves 18 to 21 dollars a day. You know, multiply that by 30 days or so in a month. You can do the math and see how much you've saved almost 900 or so dollars or um, 600 or so dollars. Yeah, that's right. Right. <laughs> I think uh, I think it's a great thing. It's not math class. Um, for example, you learn about the dangers of smoking and choose never to smoke. Setting your standards higher causes others to look up to you for decisions. All right. Setting your standards higher. And, and this is something that, you know, we, we, we try to remind our children, and um, uh, especially when they are at this point of life, when they are very uh, influenced by their friends and wanting to conform, uh, sometimes they might lower their standards in order to fit in. Remember, that's what a part of conformity is, right? Um, and, and so it's necessary that they do the opposite. They set their standards higher. Right? There's nothing wrong with wanting to, to fit in and to have friends and to be accepted, but they should never lower their moral standards in order to be accepted. Okay, It's the road less traveled. Remember, we covered that at the very beginning of this class, of this certification class, in the very first chapter, very first few pages of the character unit. This is the road less traveled. It's not always going to be easy. And you're going to face opposition when you choose to do the right thing. Because doing the right thing is not societally popular. <laughs> you know, society makes doing the wrong thing so great. Okay? Uh, they make it look you know, like a person is so cool. I mean, you know, if you've ever remember um, watching the old shows, uh, the cool person always smoked. You know, he always smoked. Uh, you know, he, the bad guy smoked. Everybody smoked. You know, they used to have smoking billboards and advertisements with the old, you know, the old cowboy leaning against the wall with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. You know, if you wanted to be a cowboy, well, you needed a hat, you needed a boot, you needed spurs, you needed a strong horse, and you needed a cigarette. Right. And Marlboro was the brand. OK. And, but but really what's cool is being a person that others can look up to. Right. Uh, look up to you because you make positive decisions. Right. They can rely on you because you're trustworthy, because you're honest, you're dependable. You know, you're a person who's going to do what you say you're going to do. You're responsible. OK. And so these are the standards that we have to get the students to understand are important. And not these superficial things that, that they see in society on a daily basis on these, uh, you know, social media platforms and so forth. Uh, those, things are, those things are fake, okay? And they don't produce long-term uh, beneficial results for a person's life. And then the next point there, it says a positive option respects authority. And the definition here is regard, it means to regard the position of one who is in charge and responsible for you. 
because it can be very easy to rebel. It can be very easy to tug at the apron strings of the mother. And sometimes daughters do this and sometimes sons might do that to their to their father, you know, kind of want to to challenge, you know, and strike out on their own and to show that they can make their own decisions. And they're, you know, they got their big boy pants on or their big girl pants on or whatever, you know, Uh, but they can show that they're responsible. They can show that they're able to make proper decisions by doing this very thing, by respecting the authority that is working to guard them and to guide them in the proper direction. And as was brought out last class, the authority is not always just a person, right? Uh, this information that we're receiving here, you could say this is the authority on positive character development. And how would you respect it, right? By reading it and then putting it into practice, you know? When the opportunity arises, you can teach it to others. But the best form of teaching is going to be through your example, okay? And so that's why it's important that we continuously go through this information over and over, you know, even, you know, even before you go to bed, you know, or when you get up in the morning, you know, you pick up something out of the previous lesson that we read and you might read a couple of points, right? And then think about that throughout the day and you'll have that on your mind. And you might not face something where you have to, you know, uh, bring this in, into play, but you might face something and it's going to be on your mind and you're going to be glad that it's right there on the forefront of your mind because now... You have the power to make a choice, a positive choice that won't bring harm to yourself or the other person. You know, maybe they're having a bad day. Now it's your opportunity to help them to have a better day by your example. For example, showing respect for parents and teachers by listening to and following their instructions, uh, which are for your benefit, causes others to respect you. It causes others to respect you, right? Um... You know, in some cases, you know, others might make fun of you. <laughs> you know, they might call. I know when I was growing up, it was popular when, when the person, a student, listened to and maybe, maybe even said, yes, ma'am, or yes, sir, or, or used the teacher's proper, you know, last name, yes, Mr., you know, uh, Mr. Johnson or whatever. And sometimes the students will call them brown noses, you know. Oh, you're a teacher's pet. <laughs> Why? Because you were doing the right thing. Because you were being respectful. You know, you were showing respect for authority. Um, and you know, some people, it didn't bother, right? Because you knew you were doing the right thing. But some people, if they allow those types of things from their peers to bother them, that might influence them to not uh, continue to show that type of respect for authority. In other words, they start lowering their standards in order to fit in. Well, this is something, again, that we have to remind them never to do uh, because you know, 10, 15 years down the road, you know, their reputation is going to be built based on the series of decisions that they make. That's how your reputation is built, by the way others see you, based on the choices that you make. They don't know what you're thinking. They can't read your mind. But to a degree, they can know how you think based on how you act. Okay. So let's look at the next point there. It says a positive option obeys the rules. Now remember what we covered in regard to rules. Rules are given for our knowledge, safety, and to help things run smoothly. And I want to just uh, let me see here. look back here to um, page four, I'm referring to our rules here, underneath the uh, rewind and review, because we're talking about self-control. And it says here, if you look at that last paragraph or that paragraph under rewind and review it says learning to develop and practice self-control on a consistent basis and in all situations is a long-term process you know in other words it's not going to take place overnight you know i picked up the self-control book and i just i just consumed that entire thing in one sitting you know why is it that i'm still getting angry you know why is it that i still uh, you know, lash out at people, or why is it that I, I, I'm still late for work, or whatever the case might be. Well, it's a long-term process, right? It's, it's, uh, it took us a while to get into the state that we're in, uh, maybe where a person might be um, a procrastinator, right? Uh, and it's going to take you a while to get out of that habit of procrastinating, so you won't be late, so you won't put things off, so you'll do things immediately so that you can get them done, and you can develop that characteristic of being a responsible and a dependable person, individual. 
The first step in understanding self-control is to explore how it relates to morality. Now, in the unit on character, you learned about morality and how to develop a positive moral character. And this is the point I wanted to cover here. Morals are rules. Morals are rules. And this is what we're talking about here. Obeys the rules. A, pol a positive option obeys the rules. Morals are rules that help us behave in ways that are appropriate, caring, and thoughtful of others and ourselves. They are universal in that most people, regardless of nationality or ethnicity, agree with and uphold them. Moral values define your character and your ability to control yourself. So why are you not making those decisions? The decisions that you want to make. You know, why are we still lashing out and not practicing self-control? Well, we have to go back and look at our moral values, right? We have to go look at our moral values and the things that we hold high and deem as important in our own mind. Because these things define our character and our ability to control ourselves. So if the standard is set low in regards to our moral values, then we have to start taking it up a notch by applying these things, the principles that we're learning in the Peaceful Solution. And the more consistent that we are in doing it, the easier it will become. Remember, change is always difficult at the beginning, right? Um, it, it's always difficult, that, that inertia. You know what they talk about um, in regards to physics. You know, inertia is that, that change of, of direction or force or speed uh, in one direction or another, right? The inertia you feel when you step on the accelerator in your car, right? It throws you back if, you, if you've got a car with enough horsepower to do that, you know? Uh, you know. I've had some clunkers that really couldn't do that. It felt like I was stepping on the brake. But when you step on the accelerator, it throws you, throws you back in your seat. Or, you know, you feel it even if you don't step on it really hard. But once you're going 30 miles an hour, or 35 miles an hour, or 75 miles an hour, as the speeds are here on the Texas highways, you don't feel that anymore. You know, you don't feel that, that 30 mile an hour or that speed throwing you in the back because you've become accustomed to it. That inertia, that change from stopping to start is no longer there. And it's the same thing with changing our behavior, changing our character, right? If we've had a negative character for 30 or 40 or 50 years, and now we're, tar we're starting to change that, right? We're changing the direction of it or we're, we're pointing our ship or our, our vehicle in another direction, right? Well, we have resistance, right? And it, and it takes time and it takes effort. But the more consistent we are in it, then it becomes like sitting in that car at 30 miles an hour, right? You can move and you can turn around and you're not fighting this change of speed, just like being in a plane. Many of us have been in a plane, right? And, and have you walked around in the plane when they, the captain, of course, turns the seatbelt light off? Have you ever get, had to get up and go to the bathroom or stretch your legs? You know you're getting up and going to the bathroom and walking around at 500 miles an hour? Does it feel like you're walking around at 500 miles an hour? It doesn't. You know, the only time you feel that change is when that plane is taking off. You know, and that's, that's what I enjoy the most about flying is the takeoff and the landing. And the turbulence, too. Those are kind of fun, but <laughs> that is if you don't have a weak stomach. But, but it's the same thing with uh, developing a positive character. It's always a little bit difficult at first, but once we consistently practice it and do it over and over, and, of course, setting our minds that we're not going to allow anything to any roadblocks to prevent us from, you know, developing these positive character, this positive character, then it becomes like, walking around in the plane at 500 miles an hour. It's very easy to do. A person with moral values distinguishes between right and wrong and makes choices that will cause no harm to himself or others. Immoral values, on the other hand, lead to, <coughs> lead to inappropriate behavior that is disrespectful, inconsiderate, and even dangerous. One having immoral values tends to develop enemies. Crime, violence, and abuse all stem from immoral values. And of course, tying that right into what uh, William was covering in the previous class, when a person holds on to those immoral values, then they are more than likely are going to pick these negative options and how they behave. Okay? But when you're holding on to moral values, remember a positive option, the first thing that we covered here is moral, then you're going to as we were talking about, talking about here in this last point, you know, you're going to obey the rules. 
you're going to practice morality. So rules are given for our knowledge, safety, and to help things run smoothly. Um, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, the rules that uh, a company might put in place about, um, you know, not, uh, you know, not, not, not a delivery company might have a rule about not using your phone, you know, when you, uh, when you drive the company vehicle, right? Uh, because they want you to not be distracted. They want you to keep your eyes on the road. Uh, if they, if you haven't, you need to navigate, then you need to use the GPS that they provide with you or, or look at a map beforehand. I don't think anybody looks at maps anymore except when they pass them on the tour, tour section at the, you know, at the, the bookstore or Walmart, you know. Um, but they put these things in the place in order for there to be safety, right? Um, I saw a, a sign one time that said... Uh, um, it kind of tied into our, our, our um, the true, I think it was the true test of self-control is what you do when no one's looking, but um, it, was, it was in regards to safety. And I thought that was neat because it, it tied right into what we teach here. But if I think about it, I'll, I'll bring it to your attention. But it says, for example, sitting quietly and paying attention to the teacher as you have been instructed helps you to gain much more knowledge than those who do not. Having knowledge will help you to become an instructor of others. Even if a person does not necessarily endeavor to become a teacher, as in the capacity of standing up in front of the classroom, writing on the chalkboard, and directing students, either way, you're going to teach by your actions. You're going to teach by your words. You're going to teach by your example. And so having the right knowledge and knowing how to use that knowledge in an appropriate way and at an appropriate time will help you to be a positive example to others. In effect, will help you to teach others the peaceful solution. And then at the bottom here, in this last paragraph, it says, positive choices can lead to rewards. A reward is not always something tangible or something that you can hold in your hand, okay? Uh, sometimes people, especially, uh, <laughs> especially children, they're uh, they look for reward, something tangible uh, that they can hold in their hands. Now, this is not to, to say that their uh, verbal rewards are not appreciated, appreciative, because they are. Uh, people do like to hear that they did a great job, you know, or that, you know, you're very appreciative of them showing up on time, like, uh, you know, in regards to coming to work or coming to school, right? Because we're talking about, uh, in this case, you know, school-age children showing up to school on time. Um, doing a great job, sitting quietly. You know, as a teacher, these are some of the things that, that you can do to kind of reward your students, not always with a, a physical or a tangible treat, but a positive and a kind word. You know, sometimes those things go a long way. It's, uh, I don't remember who it was. Uh, it might have been um, Dale Carnegie or, or, or one of those other um, uh, philosophers who said uh, um, people don't always remember what you did to them or what you said to them, but they remember how you made them feel. You know, they remember how you made them feel. Why? Because as we're going to cover in this next chapter here, emotions are extremely powerful, extremely powerful, right? And when you make a person feel great and it brings up a positive emotion, they're going to better associate you or that activity or that circumstance uh, in their mind. They're going to remember it. On the flip side, if you bring up a, a negative emotion in them, they're going to remember it just as well. So it's a strong emotion, either positive or negative. You know, people, people remember these things. So it's not always something tangible, such as a gift or other material gain. Sometimes the reward is simply the satisfaction. Now, this is speaking of us, the individual, the satisfaction of knowing you have made the right choice. And I tell you, there's nothing more satisfying especially when you're kind of, you know, conflicted and, and, and battling some thoughts in your mind or you're going through a situation and you, you've really got to weigh all the options out, right? And it's not something that's instant. This might be something that's been going on for several days or a week or several weeks, you know, and, and you have to make a choice. And when you finally make that choice and you know that it's the right choice, there's just this great feeling of satisfaction that comes over you, you know, like a great relief. 
you know, that, that uh, you know, a physical reward just can't, just can't equal to. So the satisfaction of knowing you made the right choice. A strong moral character is the ultimate reward for making right choices. It's the ultimate reward if we set our mind on that goal, right? Uh, and like I said before, two people can look at the same reward or the same circumstance two totally different ways, right? A person who makes the right choice and knows that they're building a strong moral character and who has a, a, you know, a positive outlook on things is going to say, well, you know, at least I'm making the right choice. You know, at least I'm uh, confident in the decision that I made that it was a positive one. You know, at least I'm building a positive character. You know, a person who has a negative mindset was, man, I did the right thing and I didn't get nothing out of it. You know, where, where's my reward for making the right choice? I might as well just make the wrong choice then. <laughs> it's all about mindset and how we look at these things. This is why it's important that and let's go, we go over that in the Peaceful Solution, you know, to set our mind in advance, you know, to focus and to accentuate the positive and to eliminate the negative. You can take anything and look at it in a negative way, okay? Be positive. Making one right choice can start you heading in the direction of long-range benefits for years to come. And in the little box there, it says, the choice is yours. Make it a positive one. So let's look over to page 19 here. And we see a couple of, of um, examples here of positive choices. And, uh, and we can use the lines. This is where you would have uh, giving your students an activity here to use the lines to write the possible rewards. And of course, you know, with, with different students and different scenarios and different um, environments and circumstances in the person's life, uh, you know, they're going to have they're going to have different answers. And we, as a teacher, we have the, you know, kind of like these are kind of icebreakers and so forth to to give us direction in 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 regards to where the answers should be focused on. Um, but let's look at here. We have four questions here. I think, yeah, we can get through these four questions here. Uh, four questions here. It says or or examples. It says being honest and returning a lost wallet to its owner. Okay, so these are examples of uh, positive choices and the possible rewards that can come. So part of that would be, you know, the satisfaction of knowing you made the right choice. Uh, it demonstrates your honesty and relieves the anxiety and fear of the owner. Uh, creates a trust for you in the other person's mind um, for doing that, even if they didn't know you beforehand. Right. Uh, I, I've seen many articles or examples that have come over the news where somebody had something similar to this take place. Right. Uh, they lost something uh, or, or their, their vehicle was stolen and it was re or a bike was stolen and it was returned to them or something took place. And a, and a stranger made a moral decision to see to it that that person's property was restored or help was given where, where it could have been given, where most people would have ignored it. Right. And the comment that they say is my faith is restored in humanity, right? Because there's so much negativity around us. There's so much selfishness around us. You know, people just, you know, uh, ignore the fact that somebody is, is, is suffering from some type of, uh, you know, sometimes even in the middle of a crime, <laughs> you know? Um, people, instead of calling 911, will more likely have their phones going like this. I'm going to post this on YouTube, right? Right when somebody is, you know, being... A fight's taking place or, or you know, a, a car accident or, or road rage is taking place. You know, instead of doing something that can help de-escalate the situation, people just try to, I guess, document it and put it in a time capsule. So being honest and returning a lost wallet to its owner, we see some of those um, positive rewards there. Um, it was interesting because not that long ago, I think it was, um, I don't remember what city it was, but uh, people have these what they call ring ring doorbell cameras and there's other manufacturers too but it was a couple of young people I think it was about three of them they were you know 10 11 12 years old and they were riding around in the neighborhood and they found a person's wallet and um, and they found where the person lived and they were not very far and they actually brought the wallet back to the person's house and rang the doorbell now the person was it wasn't home but they were able to speak to them through the ring doorbell you know, and of course, they made the news and everything because, you know, they did a great thing, right? And, um, and that, that reward of knowing you did the right thing and, I guess, maybe getting your 15 minutes of fame in their case, you know, you know, it makes a person feel great. And it's not always a matter of doing it 
for money. Number two here, not smoking cigarettes. One of the rewards could be uh, it prevents addiction to nicotine, uh, prevents the diseases that, uh, that could come with smoking, um, and it also is a decision that could lead to a long, healthy life, right? Um, because anything that you put in your body that's harmful, it's going to start to weaken the body, you know, and it could weaken particular organs that take in that, that those toxins or poisons, and it could also start to kind of ripple outward and affect different organs as well. Uh, number three is addressing your teacher as Mr. Smith. Uh, that positive option can bring a reward of speaking with respect to an adult, uh, showing, <clears throat> showing honor. It also could uh, be the teacher will become or be more likely to show you respect in return, um, especially in a society where people don't understand respect is something that must be given, not earned. Uh, but when people are respected, they tend to show that in return as well. And number four there, it says doing chores, uh, choosing that positive option. It could be pleasing to your parents, uh, satisfaction of completing a task that teaches you how to take care of yourself and prevents you from becoming uh, a couch potato. <laughs> yeah, because you're not just sitting there watching television or watching shows. You know, they. it's funny because I, I didn't think about it until many years later, but, you know, society kind of, kind of wants uh, young people, and I'll say the entertainment industry, wants young people to drown out their, their way of thinking with entertainment. You know, there would be cartoons on Saturday. There were cartoons in the morning before you went to school. And there were cartoons right around 3 o'clock when the person, when the children came home from school, you know, not educational things, but let's take all that time you had in learning, you know, your, your uh, lessons throughout the day and let's wash it all away with taking you to a fairy land, <laughs> you know, so you can become a couch potato. Well, you know, when you come home and you have responsibilities, you have chores you have to do and so forth, you know, it helps to build that responsible character within you where you're not just, you know, sitting down and drowning out your your day through the television. And so that's very important in developing these characteristics. And so we're going to stop there. We're going to pick up on page 20 next class. And our next class is uh, the 20, 23rd. Um, just double check there on that. Yes, it is um, Wednesday, the 23rd, 5.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. I do thank you for, all for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at the very next class. Have a great evening.